the backdrop to this new report coming out from The Guardian just this morning that says Paul Manafort met with Julian Assange, a claim that WikiLeaks about four minutes ago tweeted out and disputed. Can you explain what the significance of this would be? Again, if accurate, The Guardian is hinging this, I think, on, on one well-placed source they're citing. Uh, well, in, in my understanding, Hallie, uh, from one of the reporters that's been involved, uh, Luke Harding, who I happen to know, is that this is based on a, on a on source or sources, as well as uh, some documents that they've been able to review. Uh, you know, Hallie, the significance of this, the, the Guardian report says that uh, Paul Manafort visited uh, the Ecuadorian embassy and Julian Assange in March of 2016. This was around the time, uh, as you and I both know well, you being on the campaign yep. trail and us talking about this, uh, that Paul Manafort was was joining the Trump campaign or about to join the Trump campaign. We need a little bit more detail on those dates so we can be specific about it. Uh, in addition, The Guardian report says that Paul Manafort had other trips to the Ecuadorian embassy in London uh, and that those trips started around, I believe, 2013, if I remember the report correctly. But I mean, I think that Russia played a role in, in last year's election is, is, is a matter of fact. I mean, it's certainly what US intelligence agencies believe. And practically everybody recognizes it apart from, apart from Donald Trump, who, who equivocates on the subject. So I have to tell you, just because US intelligence agencies say something, and by the way, it's not even all the intelligence agencies, it's a handpicked group uh, assembled under uh, the outgoing president of Barack Obama by James Clapper. They say something, but you know, speaking of empirical evidence, they presented no empirical evidence, and they still haven't. So I don't understand why we're supposed to take that on faith. Well, I mean, you don't take anything on faith. I mean, obviously, you seek to, to verify and to be evidential um, and to kind of to, to follow leads wherever they go. But you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a journalist and I'm a storyteller. I'm, I'm not a kind of uh, head of the CIA uh, or the NSA. But what I can tell you is that. There have been similar operations in France, uh, most recently when President Macron was elected. Well, actually, uh, which... Luke, that's not true. That's actually, that's straight up not true. The, the French, a after that election, the uh, French Cyber Intelligence Agency came out and said it could have been virtually anybody. Yeah, the, if you let me finish, um, there have been attacks on the German parliament. Okay, so, so but, but wait, Luke, do you concede that the France hack that you just claimed didn't happen? Well, th that it didn't happen, sorry? Do you concede that the France that that the Russian hacking of of the French election that you just claimed actually is not true? Well, I, I mean that it's not true. Um, I mean the French the French report was inconclusive, um, but you have to look at this kind of contextually. That we've we've seen other attacks on European states as well from from Russia that they have very kind of advanced cyber capabilities. Where else? So, sorry. Where else? Well, Estonia, have you heard of Estonia? It's a state in the Baltics, which was <laughs> crippled by a massive cyber attack in 2008, which certainly all kind of Western European uh, and former Eastern European states 
um, think was carried out by Moscow. I mean, I was in Moscow at the time where, where relations between the two countries were extremely bad. This is a kind of ongoing thing. I do understand your skepticism, but I think may, maybe you, you, you might just go to Moscow for a couple of weeks, talk to human rights people. There's a fantastic um, organization there called Memorial. Uh, meet Alexei Navalny, um, who's the main kind of opposition candidate there, uh, who's an anti-corruption campaigner, whose brother has been jailed for his activities and who's been disqualified by the Kremlin from uh, standing in the election. And just talk to people, ask them about Kremlin hacking, ask them about, I don't think it's not, I mean, talk to Russians on this. Um, I mean, I, I the Russians, be- the, the Russians I've spoken to, uh, you know, and again, I obviously I can't speak to everybody, the ones I've spoken to think all this is ridiculous. You know, if you'd read my book, which unfortunately you didn't before you decided to do the interview, you would have seen that there's a whole history of the FSB and its kind of KGB predecessor <clears throat> doing these kind of entrapment operations, uh, going back to the Cold War, um, enticing uh, American diplomats, British diplomats, and so on with kind of honey pots. Uh, the KGB <clears throat> even had a kind of term for the kind of attractive young women they would send to kind of seduce and try and compromise officials. They called them swallows which is a rather kind of pleasant uh, and poetic title. And, and, and really anyone who knows Russia or, or has bothered to read books on, on the Cold War, War sort of realizes this is precisely what they do. Now, did they do it with Donald Trump? We, we, we don't know. Let me ask you about Manafort. What was Manafort doing in Ukraine? Because I, as I think you even acknowledge in the book, again, because I, I did read uh, through it, you, you even acknowledge in the book that Manafort was not even trying to steer Yanukovych towards a pro-Kremlin policy. I mean, that's widely reported, that he actually was trying to orient Yanukovych towards the West. Well, it, I mean, it's, it, it, it's more complicated than that. Um, uh, I, I mean, certainly some of the things he did were kind of pro-Western, but at the same time, what, what, what Manafort really did was to take someone who was a, essentially a kind of post-Soviet crook and gangster and, and refashion him into the image of a kind of modern Western-style politician. And, and it, it was, quite successful. Um, and when I met Manafort in 2008, he told me that, that Yanukovych believed in the rule of law, that he'd changed, that he was not a, a creature of Moscow anymore, uh, and so on. It would be great if you could go to Moscow, go to Kiev, go to the post-Soviet world, talk to people from the Russian opposition, talk to human rights activists, talk to journalists whose colleagues have been murdered, and perhaps understand a little bit better the kind of state that, that, that Vladimir Putin's Russia is. I think you'd be doing yourself a service and you'd be doing your listeners the, a service. I don't think I've countered anything you said about the state of Vladimir Putin's Russia. The issue under discussion today has been whether there was collusion, the, the topic of your book. Yeah, I know, but you're clearly a kind of collusion rejectionist. I'm not kind of sure what evidence short of Trump and Putin in the sauna together would convince you. Clearly nothing would convince you. But, but again, anyways, no, but, 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 but again, well, look, this, this gets back to the issue. The question is whether there is, a, there is any evidence so far, and, and I don't see it. And it looks like Luke has logged off. Is that true? Well, we've lost Luke Harding. Um, I'm not sure if that was intentional or not, but regardless, we're going to wrap the interview here. The book is called Collusion, Secret Meetings, Dirty Money, and How Russia Helped Donald Trump Win.